Hello everyone, welcome back to a new episode of Final Fantasy 16. Last time we left off, we were hanging out over here doing a quest with Torgal, which was incredibly, incredibly adorable, I must say. So, onwards to, uh, I think I want to do the Garnic thing first, rather than Randala. So, uh, let's go take care of this first. So. Uh, Garnick right there. I think this will just be a faster one to wrap up real quick. Where's, uh, meeting with Havel at Randala for Byron? Seems like it, uh, maybe has a little bit more going on. Um, this is also where we came... Like, we were just over here, and I said, oh, there's probably a quest over here. Um, so yeah, this is the one for Tomes, I believe, where, uh, Tomes had a friend over here that, um, had some books. Well, I guess it's, the, the quest is technically for Vivian, but Tomes had a friend over here that had a bunch of books, and we need to get one of said books for Vivian. Things are not good in Ash. Things are, uh, looks abandoned. not great. No. Which house would a bookworm live in? Hmm, probably the one that actually opens. Sorry to sorry to break the fourth wall on you, Clive, but uh, yeah. Uh, little item right there, just a potion. That's fine. All right, so let's just go ahead and get in here. Doesn't look like much is going to be happening in this place. Did get a free potion and high potion though. Which I will definitely, definitely take. Oh yeah. Yep. Bunch of books all over the place. Empty shard. Complete botany of banes. Oh. Ader Fotida? Or Tale of Wyvern? White of flower and black of root, the latter of which gives an inky gall when cut or crushed. The tribesmen of Northern Storm prick their skin with oaken needles soaked in such, drawing curious patterns about their arms and legs in honor of their heathen gods. Rude. <laughs> God, it's such a, it's such a, it's a thing I hate so, so much where, um, you know, the, the main religion is like any religion that's not ours is heathenous and they're savages and things. Christianity did this a lot. The gall is passing toxicate, that a single drop taken by mouth may result in cramps most powerful for five days and five nights, or if applied to a wound, certain death. Should a slip of the needle end a young warrior's life, it is said that his skin print failed to find favor among the heavens. Yeah, so the uh, specific group over here does tattoos is interesting. Very, very interesting. His interests were certainly varied. The Folklorist Fabulary, the Moogle. No spirit or sprite appears more often in Valisthean folk tales than the humble Moogle. Though they are occasionally painted as mischievous souls akin to pixies or imps, most stories depict them as clumsy yet congenial spirits who delight in helping mankind with their daily labors. They are said to have sweet tooths, leading to a common superstition that one must not leave cakes or other sweet meats uncovered overnight, lest naught remain but crumbs and become mourning. In appearance, they are described as being covered head to toe in soft white fur, excepting the small dark wings by which they are somehow able to take flight, and the brightly colored pom-poms that protrude from the top of their heads, and yet there is one detail regarding the Moogle that most find more remarkable than even the orb that tops its brow, the fact that the creatures actually exist. Preposterous, I hear you cry. Everybody knows that Moogles are the stuff of legend. Quite agree, but every legend has its basis in truth, and in case of the Moogle, the fact that may be... Not so dissimilar to the fiction, ancient uh, bestiaries list the, or bestiaries, list the white mole whose feet do not touch the ground among the beasts of the realm. And the illustration beside the name, why it's none other than none other than the Moogle. I always get bestiaries screwed up because um, a few times I've heard people call it a bestiary, which makes sense because bestiaries usually list like you know the different manners of fauna in a world. So, bestiary makes sense, but I'm pretty sure it is bestiary. 
and it's also spelled that way, which makes a lot of sense too. It's it's a weird word for me because I've jumped between the pronunciations. For the longest time, I called it bestiary because that's how it's spelled. And then I heard if like a YouTuber or two refer to it as bestiary, so then I jumped to bestiary. And then I realized, uh, yeah, no, I, I heard a different person say bestiary, and I'm like, is it bestiary? Of course, it is true that the creatures are not known to still survive in the twins of the modern day. Perhaps their miniature wings carried them to other climes. Perhaps they were hunted to extinction, or perhaps just, perhaps, they do still live among us, hidden away far from human view. Chapter 14, or er, 16. Yep, chapter 16. Ah, funny, Final Fantasy 16, The Fall of the Bears. The emergence of the first magic adepts was widely heralded as a gift from the gods. Indeed, the title with which those with the gift came to be commonly known is most likely a contradiction of Bearer of the Holy Blessing. The word used by the tribunes of the time, those born with the blessing were lauded as living crystals and granted high office and plentiful reward for their status as chosen ones. Over the years, this reverence for their kind would become a full-fledged religion led by the bearers themselves, a development that would prove fateful. The divers' nations of the time were unanimous of their disapproval of the founding of the church, while the authorities had for years welcomed bears into positions of power in their own structures of state, they were mistrusting of an organization led by bears for bears. Efforts were immediately made to cha uh, chasten the church and its followers, banning members from holding office, evicting adherents from their homes, and breaking up meetings by force. The church responded by forming a volunteer army to resist this persecution, and yet it continued, creating a cycle of ever-increasing bloodshed and rancor, and a growing rift between those born with a blessing and those without. What began with beatings and street clashes would eventually spill over into an all-out war that consumed the greater part of the twins for nigh a generation and decimated the population of men and bears both, the deluge of blood that stained the land in crimson and left an everlasting, or ever more lasting mark upon the minds of the Valisthean people. After the bears' last resistance was crushed, the nations of Valisthea came together to sign the Continental Accord that initiated a system of slavery that persists across the realm to this day. So well-known phrase, bears are other than human, has its roots in the bitter war of the years before, being the unblessed's only excuse for their calamitous refusal to allow the blessed to decide their own destinies. Yeah, so the bears of today... But if what it says is true, I need to get this back to the hideaway. So, the bears of today have to pay for what the bears of the past did. And I mean, it seems like the bears of the past were at one point trying to run everything themselves and you know they were getting higher office and everything and trying to trying to build the society around their needs and what they want but uh they then lost the war and in history <laughs> you know the uh the victor chose how they wanted the world formed after that and uh they chose to enslave them and that's persisted for centuries in the wake of the tragic fire at Cairn Orvent in 873 V, and the subsequent depletion of our most highly practiced intelligencers, all mainland strongholds were instructed to redouble training in clandestine maneuvers, improvised weaponry, and assassination techniques, and dispatch promising volunteers to Stone here for inspection. This report details progress made by the stronghold at Garnick in reinvigorating Walud's ranks of esteemed intelligencers. Yeah, yeah, we know about that. Alrighty. So yeah, that is definitely uh, interesting for knowing more about the world and how things kind of ended up how they were. Leaving so soon, stranger. Ah, uh, they don't want me to know. I'm watching you from a distance, so to speak. Subtle. I know who you are. Then we need not waste time on introductions. Hand me the book. Leave it in our care and return to your life. Your care? Do you mean to burn it or bury it? That is not my decision to make. But by one means or another, its contents shall be removed from the common record. Then I'll have to politely refuse. I won't let you erase our history. Then we find ourselves at an impasse. Very well. The book can just as easily be pried from your dead hand. Okay. Let's see, shall we? Yeah, they don't want the truth getting out. 
It is interesting with this book, uh, too. You also have to, uh, think about the potential of is the narrator flawed or not. Like, um... And stuff. I doubt they are in this particular instance, but you always have to think about that with, uh, records like this stuff. Um, so... What an interesting development, is basically what I'm saying. That, yeah, this reason that the bears are hated on is specifically because of a war that happened between the two groups. It does remind me a little bit of, um, you know, the story of, uh, specifically Korra in Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, because, uh, specifically Korra, the first, like, season of it, specifically deals with this idea of people that can use magic against people that can't use magic. Um, and, uh, you know, how that's dealt with, and obviously people that can't use magic being scared of people that can use magic, or feel like, um, they're not being treated the same and stuff like that, so. Um, the first season of Korra is definitely weird in some ways in relation to that, but, yeah. It's always a topic that comes up in, uh, these sorts of things a lot, in a world where, you know, some people can use magic and other people can't. Uh, Dragon Age does it a lot, too. It's a- it's a pretty hot topic. And it makes sense, because, I mean, it is something people would have to think about in a world where some people can use magic and some people can't. It's interesting seeing the different ways that, um... Uh, games and fiction will- will go to, because sometimes it's the people that can use magic that are on top, sometimes it's the people that can use magic are specifically kind of enslaved because they're not trusted, like... Like this, you know? So, it's just interesting. Seeing all the different interpretations of that. Here I- here I am talking about, uh, <laughs> talking about stories in video games while just beating the absolute shit out of you dorks. Ooh, clutch mine. So, it didn't work out. Impressive. But we have other means. We shall claim the book yet. Why do you want it so badly anyway? It lays out in no uncertain terms the vanity and avarice of mankind. It tells the shameful history of the persecution and oppression of a gifted few by a giftless many. Would you say that this interpretation was correct? I don't know. You don't know. Your sword may be sharp, but your wits are dull. So let me answer for you. There is no correct interpretation of history. That a series of events took place may be proved beyond a doubt. But there can be no single, immutable explanation as to why they came to pass. It is a question of numbers and of belief. If enough people believe that a set of events occurred for a reason, that belief becomes the truth. So you're trying to control the truth? We are trying to protect people from themselves, from knowledge that would bring them naught but pain. That is all. You may keep the book for now. The world is small. We shall meet again. Until then. Wait! Damn it. Let's get this back to Vivian. Perhaps she can explain what that was all about. I think people deserve to know... ...the truth about, uh... ...events. Or at least... ...or at least, once again, depending on... If the narrator is to be believed here, um, a version of the truth and things like that. Knowing as much about these kinds of things from history is important because then we can learn from them. <laughs> so, I think it's important for, for people to know these things. And I think just hiding it and just covering it up is a, frankly, horrible, horrible way to look at it. Because then you're just kind of destined to repeat the same mistakes. Of course, sometimes you're destined to repeat the same mistakes anyway, because people do have access to this information and just make the same mistakes over and over and over.
But I would rather them have the option to change instead of not. I found it. The book you lost. Here you go. No mention is made as to the name of the author, whether that is because the title page has been lost to time or because the tome was published anonymously, it is impossible to say. You... You found it. Thank you, Clive. Even though I asked this of you, I was not entirely sure it would be possible. I feared the executors had seized every copy. I met with one of these... Executors, and I convinced him to let me keep it. He told me something that the truth is just a matter of collective belief, and that if enough people believe a lie, that lie becomes the truth. It does, but it also means that the truth is not immutable, that it can be changed, provided that those who wish to change it can convince enough people that their perspective is the correct one. As the sad history of the bearers proves. You said that the book inspired you to become a scholar. It did. Or its author, rather. She was a heretic, you see. A firebrand and a dissenter. A gallows stood ready for her in every corner of the realm. And by shunning society, or perhaps being shunned by it, she stumbled upon a truth so potent that an entire realm trembled at the prospect of its utterance. I, too, have always felt somehow set apart from the world of men. A stranger to my own species. She taught me that my solitude was not a curse, but a gift. And that, though my journey to the truth might be a lonely one, what I found at my destination would be more than worth the cost. Do you still feel that way? That you're not... one of us? Honestly? I'm not entirely sure anymore. Since coming to the hideaway, I find my thinking somewhat... clouded. Perhaps the result of studying mankind from a rather... closer perspective than I had intended. But the more I study... The more I find value in this perspective, in looking not from the outside, but from within. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to continue my work here. Remember, Clive, when enough people believe, belief begets truth. Give the men and women of this benighted world the gift of truth. Make them believe in you, as I do. I'll try, Vivian. I'll try. Man, we're two for two on the cool quest back to back here. Like I said, that one, uh... That one, that one covers some interesting stuff. Scholar's Bonnet. Vivian Ninetales scholarly headwear awarded to her upon completion of her studies at the University of Canver. Give the men and women of this benighted world the gift of truth. Make them believe in you as I do. Yes. But yeah, interesting stuff there. <laughs> a new quest popped up. Um, like I said, a lot of games and just fiction covers this. The idea of what do you do in a world where people can use magic and others can't. Um, the Witcher covers it. Dragon Age covers it. Korra covers it. This covers it. Like, um, even, uh, what is it? Um, I've mentioned this. Uh, the Wheel of Time series. It, it heavily, heavily talks about these sorts of things and it it is just such an interesting topic because it's one we don't really have to worry about facing ourselves so when put into a fictional perspective like this there's a lot that can be you know talked about and been like be like what would we do in that situation because you know let's see the wailing banshee curse breakers came across this creature while searching for survivors near the abandoned village of garnick Misled by the Abomination's appearance into thinking she might be a local woman, they went to offer their help, but soon it was they who were seeking salvation. Survivors say they can still hear the screams, both those of the Whites and other, those of their fallen comrades. Hmm. Alright. I mean, we can go over there really quick and quickly and take care of that, but... Yeah, it is, it is just one of those, uh, one of those interesting things. You know, to think about. And I think that's why media kind of, uh... 
looks into it as much as it does. So, enough about that. I'm terrible at, ex at explaining my thought process, so there's so many thoughts swirling in my head at any time that it's kind of difficult to sift them all and give a, you know, good explanation of what I'm trying to get across. It's hard to articulate my thoughts and play a game at the same time, basically, is what I'm saying. So... It can only- it can only do so much here. But yeah, interesting quest. Thought-provoking and stuff like that, so... We- we like- we like those. Those are cool quests. And also linking back into the, you know, kind of plot of the world and everything and... Uh, all of that. It's always much more interesting than just a simple fetch quest that has you go from point A to point B. Um, it's way more interesting to have it actually link back into the world and kind of provide value to the narrative and world building. Yep. Does indeed. Alright, Benedicta. Yeah. Whoop. Let's see if we can do, uh, one of these. Maybe. Ow. You got me. Fuck. When you're in the middle of a combo, it's really, really hard to, um, you know, like, get back into the mo- uh, the Mega Flare mode, and then, like, um, actually get the dodge off in time. That's definitely the attack that's easiest to, uh, proc the Mega Flare with. Is this gonna reach you? It is. There we go. God, that wind hurts so much more than you would think it would. Dang. Go ahead and get some heals here. I wanted to go ahead and do this. Oh my god, you held on to that forever. Uh huh. There we go. Uh, wind up. I don't think, uh, I don't think, um, What's-His-Face would be very happy about me beating up on, uh, something that comes from, uh, Benedicta with Titan's powers. <laughs> don't think you'd be a very excited camper about that. But, you know, it's gotta happen. Alright. Uh, hit you with an impulse. Build up the meter as much as we can. And there we go. But yeah, to, to go into, uh, specifically with what I was talking about before while we're in the middle of this fight, to go into a topic that's been covered by um, a uh, YouTube channel I watch a ton of that uh, has covered, like, Pokemon and stuff, you can have, like, fairly mundane quests or plot points in something, and they can be made infinitely more interesting if you just have it service the actual narrative and world building in some way. Like, you can have a boring fetch quest, but as long as it does something interesting with the narrative or, you know, gives you some sort of information in a cool way or explains how something in the world works, you can make anything interesting. Um, what they specifically talked about in a lot of their reviews of the Pokemon anime was like, a lot of their favorite episodes are things that explain like, how how people how people use Pokemon like you know if you had creatures in your world that could breathe fire you know how would they change how society works and things like that and I think that's a lot of what makes some quests very interesting in this um, there's obviously ones like the Torgal one where it's like yeah that's just a cool quest narratively because we're connected to the character but the previous quest with Vivian was interesting because it just does a lot of stuff for the story but. I'm probably just talking in circles at this point, but, uh, we're, we're just wailing on this, this poor thing, so 
I thought it was a good time to get some of my thoughts out. Once again, I am just terrible at articulating my thoughts. It doesn't mean I don't like trying to explain myself, I just <laughs> feel like I'm really, really terrible at it a lot of the time. Oop, none of that, please. Fortunately, that does not work. And it just gets me blown the fuck up as <laughs> well. God. You have like one HP, just die. There we go. Gizmaluk. I was trying to remember I was trying to think about where I remembered that name. And Rest in peace. Isn't that the name of an area in Final Fantasy IX? Like Gizmaluk's Grotto? I swear that is the name of something in Final Fantasy IX. Gizmaluk's Grotto, Gizmaluk's Grotto. It must be it must be a name from some sort of mythos um, that I'm just not super familiar with. But let's go let's let's go back to to dumb not talking about anything of substance quasi because I think we've had enough talking about substance for today. Uh, back to dumb me. All right. What do we got? Uh, reduce Heaven's Cloud cooldown by two and a half seconds. So that's the new thing you have. Not crazy interested in that. Um, yeah, we need to get down there. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. oh, you're talking about that. I was like, what are, what are we talking about, friends? Yeah, they're just talking about that. All right, Havel. Havel the Rock, I'm on my way. Ambrosia won't help me here. I'm scared. I wish Ambrosia would help me here. There's chocobos in that town. I should be able to ride my chocobo. What's my chocobo is so pretty. My nice, my nice albino chocobo. All right, so at least we took out another one of the bounties. I don't really know how many more of those are going to be left. It wasn't a pushover either, that bounty. Oh, when I was at that shop, I should have bought more high potions. What am I doing? Um, I think uh, someone in the comments also mentioned this item. Uh, here, the last elixir. Um, I believe they said you need to use it, and then the next time you die, you'll, um, like, you'll basically, this effect will happen. But... Uh, I tried to use it before, um, but it doesn't let me use it. It just says item unavailable at this time. So, I don't know how I'm supposed to use it, really. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something, or maybe the comment mentioned uh, something else in particular. But I've tried to use it before, just to see if it is like a buff effect you put on yourself. But it doesn't seem to be, because it just won't let me use it straight up. Because, yeah, I mean, the only other thing I can think of is, like... Because it'll let me use anything else right now. It'll let me use a Lionheart Tonic, even though I'm not in combat, and the Stone Skin Strength and all that. It'll let me use everything else, it just won't let me use this. So... I, I, I don't know what the point of this item is. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something really obvious, but... Hello! Turncoats and cowards, the lot of you! If it's a fight you want, it's a fight you shall have! I like those purple robes. Or like cloak. I don't need your... Please, uh, Field Marshal, oblige him. This won't take long. You're right. It won't. Will it not? Then Finish him. I like that axe design. It's kind of cool. Hello. Uh, I was meaning to do that, but I couldn't get my stuff straight. There we go. Bannerless Commandant. Bing. Boom. You are an annoying prick, and I will kill you so hard that your ancestors for years and years to come will feel how hard I fucked you up this day. <laughs> God. <laughs> you bastard. 
All right. Um. That's right. Uh huh. Yeah. Bang. <laughs> Eat that. It's over. I didn't realize you could actually hold the fist like that. I've never done it before because I'm always aiming to get the precision one. But you can't just hold on to it. Field Marshal Havel, I presume. Are either of you injured? No, my lord. You arrived just as our escort turned on us. Fucking traitors. I'd heard reports of soldiers in the outlying regions abandoning the oaths they swore. But I hadn't thought the corruption had reached so close to the heart of the Republic. It's a fucking disgrace. Your interfering old bastard of an uncle tried to warn me, of course. My Lord Marquis, or is Sid the outlaw more to your liking? Call me what you want. It doesn't change who I am. All the urgency of the message I bring. My uncle has a plan to right the realm, and he needs your help to see it through. Before I agree to anything, I'd have you answer one question. What do you stand to gain from all this? I won't deny that I might benefit from further chaos. But I seek a new beginning for all of us. And while the choices I've made may not always have been the right ones, I know I made them for the right reasons. For so long, so many of us have been told how we could live, how we could die, when it should have been our decision all along. Now we have a chance to put things right. But in order to take it, we must stand together. Even if it be beside those with whom we don't see eye to eye. Certainly not the words I expected from an outlaw. But perhaps your uncle was right. You are no ordinary outlaw. I'll never hear the end of this. All right. I'll start by ordering my most trusted guard to bring the Dalmechian fringes under control. Next, I'll make contact with my counterparts in the Imperial Army and see if I can't convince them to try and restore order in their own territory. Thank you, Field Marshal. But they are not the only ones we will need to convince. What do you mean? I don't doubt that I can bully some sense into a few generals. But those they answer to require a different kind of persuasion. And when it comes to honeyed words, well, we will need an envoy. One who can court even the most stubborn of statesmen. You, perhaps. I'm flattered. But I'm no diplomat either. Definitely not. And I have other problems to attend to. What we need is a skilled arbitrator. And I may know just the person. Is that so? And would he happen to be an outlaw too? Of a different kind, perhaps. Well, beggars can't be choosers. I suppose we'll all have to find a little of the outlaw in ourselves if we're to make it through this. Very well. Send your man to me right away. I shall. Who is it? Is it Otto? Uh, my Lord Marquis. Your Lord Uncle bade me escort the Field Marshal to his manor in Port Isolde. And I will see that my associate joins you there. Very good, my Lord. Huh. An envoy. I'm not sure I'm the man to talk anyone round. I can barely convince my brother to take his medicine. 
No. This is a job for someone with experience. Someone like Quinton. I hope I can convince him at least. Quinton? Not who I expected. <laughs> Not who I expected at all. Alright, off the Galton's Veils. Uh, so... No, that's that's not where I need to be. Quinton would be over here. Yeah, that's right. That's where Lost Wing is. Yeah, I forgot they moved to Orabel Downs because Lost Wing is an ether flood. I'm still shocked at how incredibly close they are to where there's an active ether flood. It's like, yeah, we're living right here. The ether flood is right here. <laughs> Also still shocked that all the people that lived in Lost Wing can can live in this small smattering of houses over here. But hey. Alright, Quentin. Apparently you're the person for the job. I, I suppose I can see it. I just expected someone from the hideaway. Not you, I guess. I guess a fair few people from Lost Wing were lost. You know, when Lost Wing went down, so they maybe they don't need as much room as I was thinking. Quinton, I have a proposal for you. Do you now? Something tells me you'll be asking more of me than a cask of goat and gold. Go on then. Propose. Yeah, I think Quinton can talk his way around him. You'd have me convince the chiefs and chamberlains of the realm that they should simply swallow their pride and do the one thing that has proved impossible for thousands of years. Was there anything else? Perhaps I can fetch you a meat pie as well. I know it's a lot to ask, but I can think of none better suited to the role. And you'd have me give up what little I have left to do it. I told you, Clive. The people of Lost Wing are my family. And I cannot abandon them. You'll have to find someone else. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> so am I. And why might that be? What he's asking. How is it any different to what you've done so far? They want you to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. That's what you do best. <laughs> if it's the vineyard you're worried about, we'll see that the grapes are picked and the tons filled. You know we will. It's not that. Then what is it? You said yourself we're family, don't you trust us? You know that's not what I'm... Then what are you saying? That only we are worth saving? Why turn your back on everyone else? You convinced us we could build new lives for ourselves, and if you can do that, who's to say you couldn't convince the entire realm? A stirring argument. I fear that any rejoinder I make might fall somewhat flat by comparison. So you'll join us? <sighs> Where do you need me? Field Marshal Havel will want to speak with you in person. He's currently in Porter's Older. I can arrange for a party of Cursebreakers to accompany you there. That would be very much appreciated. I hear the roads are far from safe these days. <laughs> Hopefully not for long. My uncle will want to know that his plan is taking shape. This is quite an in-depth quest. There's a lot- there's a lot- there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. God, we're gonna be side questing for a bit. Not complaining though, a fair few of these have been pretty cool so far. It is the nice kind of seeing us get everybody to work together, too. It's always refreshing at the end of an R- uh, of an RPG where you get to see all of your friends and stuff you've made throughout the game interact. Uncle, I bring good news. The Field Marshal has agreed to your plan. Ha! Of course he has! I didn't doubt you for a moment, dear boy. Rutherford is accompanying him back to your manor in Porter's Older as we speak. They will await your return there. As will one other. One other? Who, exactly? Lord Havel was concerned that even if he could get the realm's armies to agree to an accord, he might not be as successful in convincing those with political power. He asked if I might have a solution. 
and I suggested a certain Imperial Lord Magistrate turned Liberator. One of your co-conspirators? Master Quinton would probably call me one of his, but yes. Another outlaw, then? Just the thing we need to put these rotten politicos in their places. Good thinking, Clive. I'm glad you approve. The more the merrier, eh? Uncle, assuming Havel and Quinton can solve our problem with the armies, you still haven't mentioned how we might manage the grain shortages. Oh, don't you worry, my boy. The seven high houses will be seeing to that. They have all agreed to make the most generous of donations. Oh, of course, it did take a little persuasion, but luckily I had some unexpected help. From who? Why, you, my boy. Rumor has it that you rescued the Lady Ariane's head steward, Rockford, from a horde of bloodthirsty bandits. It was more of a handful. Well, the old battleaxe was so pleased. She had a shipload of talents delivered to my private docks by the next new moon. And when the other houses saw the parsimonious old crone's purse strings finally loosen, they as good as tripped over themselves in the rush to follow suit. <laughs> I'm happy to hear it. Now, I must be getting back to the manor. Join us there at your earliest convenience, would you? Of course, Uncle. All right. Are we actually continuing with that, or is that quest done for now and then it'll give us a new quest? No, here we go. And how, pray tell, will we get that grain to the capital if the roads are still overrun with Akashic? you find another bloody road. I only have so many men, and I'm not about to send them headlong into an ether flood. That is, unless you'd have them turn as well. Well, I'd certainly eat less. Oh, says the man with a belly bigger than a band of curls. My soldiers actually need their rations. Without any food to keep them going, they'll be dead even before you've sent them on your fool's errand. <clears throat> if I may, gentlemen, perhaps I might suggest an alternative approach. Though supply routes are indeed disrupted, there is no shortage of ships. Indeed, they bob away in every bay from here to Randalar, awaiting a safe haven. Allow them to make port and fill their bellies full of grain. And once those who crowd the cities are fed, ferry the displaced back to the countryside to work the fallow fields. Ah, but I'm sure that you wish to continue your discussion. Forgive the interruption. That's a fantastic you idea, Quentin. Friends as yourselves need no help from the likes of me. Rutherford spoke fondly of the great bond between you. Us? Friends? I can't stand the man! Clive, I'm beginning to question the quality of the company you keep. And what kind of company are you expecting him to keep? The man's a criminal! Criminal? How... how dare you! You are not fit to breathe the same air as this fine, upstanding young gentleman! Upstanding? He calls himself Sid the Bloody Outlaw! Once more unto the breach. I'm glad you're here to, to keep to keep the reins, Quentin. <laughs> Shall we begin again? What we seek here is not to create a new nation, nor to claim the thrones of those that already exist. We wish simply to bring stability to the realm that mankind might weather the current storm. And to do that, we must convince those in power, the generals, the statesmen, the nobles, that our cause is just. There will be disagreements, yes. And I imagine some resistance, much resistance. But we cannot let that deter us. If we show them the path, show them that we walk it ourselves, then I am confident they will follow. The fate of the world lies in my nephew's hands, but the well-being of her people lies in ours. And we must not squander the chance that Clive has given us. Uncle Byron, I... Now, with that settled, let's move on to the signing of the Accord. For what great moment in history hasn't been accompanied by a little ceremony? <clears throat> Citizens of Valisthea, 
I present to you the Triunity. Rutherford, my quill. Byron's such a dork. I love him, though. Best kind of dork. Well, my boy, the stage is set. That it is. This is the role you were born for. Now I ask only that you trust in the talents of your supporting cast. We shall play our parts to the best of our abilities. That you might have the opportunity to shine. The realm needs its Sir Crandall. And there is no better Crandall than you, Clive. I uh, want you to keep this signed accord as proof of our faith in you. I will. Thank you, Uncle. Well, we're really filling out our wall now. <laughs> the old wall in our room is getting full. Triunity Accord, signed by representatives from Rosaria, Dalmechia, and San Brick. This mutual accord sets the stage for a new age in Storm, if not officially, then at least in spirit. For what great moment in history hasn't been accompanied by a little ceremony? And then, yeah, Breath of Darkness, Heaven's Cloud. Cool. Well, now... Now we... Are free of our current side quests. We managed to finish all of those, and we have many, many more to grab. Uh, I think I'll go back to Clive's room and uh, just check on a few things really quickly. No new things packed up there. Ooh, the Patron's Whisper has stuff for me though. Um, let's go check that out really quickly. Hello. How do you do? Desiree. Oh, I wasn't expecting you back, sir. What do we got? Genji gloves. Ooh. Oh. The drunken galley captain has shared a table with last night is to be believed. Word of your exploits has made its way across the seas to the great continent. What is more, she claims that there are those who would see you flourish, herself being one such woman, Gareth. The oh, yes. Genji gloves. Ooh, that's big. That's big. Genji gloves. We can't get the full Genji suit from Marky Elmder, but uh, that's still pretty good. Or Marquis Elmder, not Marky. <laughs> when I was a kid, I thought it was Marky because, yeah, I, I thought I was, I thought I was smart, but no, it's Marquis. <laughs> um. All right. Genji gloves. The Island Wars increases damage dealt to enemies, just in general. The island warriors of the Far East are said to claim a piece of the armor of a slain soldier following a battle, wearing it over their own until the next encounter, at which time they finally remove it. The warriors believe that the spirit of the fallen foe will now lend them their strength. Wind-up damage, diamond dust damage, giga flare damage. Increasing diamond dust will damage is very strong. Wind-up damage by 10% is very good too. Um, all of these are good. I mean, this is just a 5% increase in damage, so I'm going to get rid of Giga Flare increased damage for the Genji Gloves, because this is basically trading for, instead of just 5% increased Giga Flare damage, it's 5% increased damage to everything. So that seems like a nice alternative there. We're slowly filling our equipment slots in with some of the best items we can get, aren't we? Alright, um, like I said, I'm gonna run back to Clive's room really quick. I'm gonna check that quest that's there. And I wanna check my wall to see how many more things we have left to get. And then... I believe we will end this episode off. Because I still gotta get it up today, so... Boom, boom. Alright, so go ahead and hop over here to the wall. A lot more stuff displayed on it now. Whole lot more stuff. The Trinity Triunity Accord, the Scholar's Bonnet, and the Charred Sparring Sword. So yeah, obviously we're still missing a lot, but we're we're getting there. We're getting there. Hello, reading table. Two of you have been together what probably feels like a lifetime now, but there's still a lot of you have to learn about that hound of yours. I'd step in front of a bloody raging behemoth if it meant protecting you. 
But that don't mean you should take it for granted. The end of the day is a hound. Sometimes he just wants someone to pat his head and rub his belly and give him a handful of Koopo nuts. You do good to remember that. Master Clive, I'm aware that there are matters of greater import which demand your attention, but should you find yourself a moment, I bid you visit me in the shelves that I might ask a single favor concerning His Highness Prince Dion. Sounds cool. Okay. It's usually me making demands of Hippocrates. I wonder what this is about. Well, that sounds like a fun quest. Okay, Dion and Harpocrates focused quest. I will take it. It occurs to me that a single word of thanks does not nearly suffice to express my gratitude for reuniting me, reuniting me with from a distance. The tome made me who I am today, and yet I thought that I should never set eyes upon it again. That those who took it from me had forever robbed me of a part of myself. But now I am whole again, thanks to you. I regret that I can only fill in the gaps in your knowledge and not the holes in your soul. For which reason I shall ever be in your debt. There we go. Alright. We got more side questing to do next time, but we put a pretty good dent in it this time, I think. So, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time for some more. <laughs>